Hi, and welcome to Arcast. I'm your host, Denny Boyden, and joining me at TechEd 2010 today is Mr. Juval Lowy. Hello, Danny. Hello, Juval. We meet again. <laughs> Absolutely. Welcome back to the show. You're, you're a frequent guest here. So, um, You are undoubtedly one of the major names in software development. Um, why don't it, for those who may not know what you do and where you hail from, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? So I'm the principal of iDesign. We specialize in .NET architecture. We do a fair amount of training as well. I'm also uh, an author. I'm now working on uh, the third edition of my WCF book. Should be out end of summer. I write magazine articles. I speak at conferences like Decade. Um, I work closely with the Microsoft product teams on next generation of the technology. What else? Uh, Microsoft says I'm a software legend. <laughs> I, saw, I, I saw a write-up on that. <laughs> somewhat of a vain title uh, due to my impact on the industry. I you guess. put that in your business card though, right, didn't you? No, I don't. You, 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 Javal Oui, software legend? No, that's too vain. I think he's so great. <laughs> and uh, to learn more about what I do, just go to um, idesign.net. Okay, very good. So you're here at TechEd this week and you're doing a talk. I, I, the minute I saw the, the title, I really wanted to talk to you about it. And unfortunately, I was able to get to your session, so I'm anxious to learn about it here but it was called the Zen of Architecture. And having a minor from college in philosophy, I know a little bit about the Eastern philosophies, but when you couple that with software architecture, that's where I start to wonder, what is it exactly that you mean by the Zen of Architecture? So the Zen of Architecture simply states that for the beginner architect, there's also multiple ways and option of doing pretty much anything. But for the master, there's all but a few. Ah, okay. Right? If you think about it, that's, that's actually true. Yes, there is so many ways of doing pretty much anything, but we just go about doing pretty much the same thing. Now, it's, it's in both strokes. I mean, you can't do the same design for a device driver and a business application and you know, a search engine. Right? But I'm referring specifically to your line of business application. Those tend to be fairly similar at the non-business specific things. And um, same uh, Sam uh, Guggenheim and I and a few others did a pre-conference here on architecture, and his opening slide was simply along the same lines. He had the first paragraph of Anna Karenina from Tolstoy, mm -hmm. and that states that um, all happy families are similar, but every unhappy family is unique. Unique, yes. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's stating almost the same thing, right? So. Obviously not all happy families are the same, right? The individuals involved are unique. But if you look at the making of a happy family, the ingredients cut, cut across all happy families, right? Right, okay. And the, and the same is true about the sound design. And so the, I first observed it uh, almost 12 years ago when I was uh, a corporate architect and I was working with quite a few divisions and different product clients and I noticed that Yes, they all work on different product lines, but in the abstract, I'm doing exactly the same with all of them. Mm -hmm. And so I asked myself, can I take it to the next level? Can I uh, distill the sort of thought process, the analytical approach, the question and the answers into almost like a checklist, almost like a meat grinder, fit into it the specific of the application, crank the handle and get the design at the end? And the answer is yes. And so I developed a process uh, we call it iDesign, the iDesign method, or just for short, the method. Okay. And the method is nothing short of a highly structured, highly mechanized approach for design. Now, it doesn't take away the creativity. You still have to be the one responsible for getting the core set of use cases mm -hmm. and the core set of building blocks and do the proper decomposition. But what the method says, first of all, it can point you in the right direction of how to decompose a system. Mm -hmm. And once the decomposition is done, the method can mechanize the rest of the design decisions. Kind of like make it just like another happy family. Yeah, so the, so the first thing that I observe is that when it comes to um, decomposing any system, it's a comprising set of services, is most people do a number of classic mistakes. For example, they try and program or design against the requirements, which is fundamentally flawed because mm. requirements always change. Right. And so, how do you insulate yourself from the change? Now, you cannot completely eliminate the impact of the change. By definition, when something changes in the user domain, something has to change in the system domain, otherwise the system is dead. Mm -hmm. The trick is how to minimize the impact of the change, how to contain it. 
Now, most people when they do uh, architecture, they do uh, functional decomposition. This is means to do A and then B and then C. They have the A service, the B service, the C service. Mm -hmm. That's a functional decomposition. That's what most people do, and that's fundamentally flawed. The only way of decomposing a system, and of course, why is it so flawed? Is because the system does much more than A and B and C. It does C, D and E and A prime, and all the variation means you end up with an explosion of building blocks. And in addition, because it's such a granular way of looking at things, somebody has to stitch those building blocks together, typically ending up being the client. So you're almost forced to put business logic in the client, which mm -hmm. is not good. Right. Um, the extreme end of that is just doing one big thing that has the A, the B, and the C. It's just, your design is just one big thing. Now, if you look at other design disciplines, like designing a house, nobody ever designs a house or a car functionally. So if you look at all the functional requirements of a house, you have to be able to do cooking and sleeping and uh, keeping warm and um, preparing homework and going as a kid and entertaining yourself as an adult and all the other things, all the functional requirements of a home. Nobody would ever build a home functionally. Let's do, we have a clean spot of land, let's just do cooking. How would you do cooking in isolation from everything else? You just hang a microwave in mid-air? Right. What are you going to do about it? It doesn't work. Separate functions, but they're interrelated through the, through right. the structure and no, and Nobody the ever does just the function. Mm -hmm. um, another wrong way of doing functionality is look at it from a structural perspective. They say, let's just build the kitchen. Well, you never just build the kitchen. You can't just build the kitchen in isolation. So you pour the foundation for the kitchen, run power from the grid to the kitchen, put the microwave, done. Okay, now let's do a bedroom. We do a bedroom the same way. Now let's talk about the cost of integrating these two monsters together, mm -hmm. rewiring everything together. It's not going to work either. So the only way of decomposing any system is by volatility. You look at areas of potential change, things that could change in the future, either between customers or the same customer site or the same application, the way they're going to use it. And every time you identify an area of volatility, you encapsulate that with a service. And then you implement the required functionality by integrating together areas of functionality. And the first thing the method provides for you is a template for classic errors to encapsulate this way. Next thing the method, and, and that's where the liability comes in because it's up to you to identify the errors of volatility. Right. Volatility is hardly ever self-evident. You have to spend a lot of time with this what if and kind of like doing the contortion of what could change, which is very time consuming. Nothing provides you with, with that. You have to do it yourself. Okay? That's okay. where the experience comes in and familiarity with the use cases and such. The other thing the message says is that if you look at what most systems uh, are comprised of, if you look at it from the requirement perspective, you may have 300 different use cases for a different size system. And 300 is not a big number. You can have many more. But how many of them are truly distinct? And the answer is very few. Mm -hmm. So you may have in any given system only a three, four, five, six would be up to here of truly distinct use cases. And we identify the core use cases is by, you know, if you have a product manager or a customer to work with, it can be just yourself. You say, if you were to pick just one thing the system was supposed to do, just one, what will it be? You would pick a core use case. And then you would say to the product manager or the customer, I'm allowing you one more. Which one would it be? Now, most at this point, we give you a variation of the first because mm -hmm. it was so important. You say, no, no, that's a variation. Give me a truly distinct one. So at that level, how many of them are you going to have? Most systems end up with three, four, five, six would be a big number of truly distinct things they do. So now the next thing you do is you look for a core set of services. So by putting them together, you satisfy the core set of use cases. Now, it turns out if you only have four, five, six distinct things you're supposed to do, how big is that set of services that's supposed to, to implement it? It's not a big set. It's not millions, right? Mm -hmm. It's not even tens, right? It's a small number. And what you will find at this point is that if you identify truly the core set of use cases, that all the other use cases, which are simply a variation of them, is just permutation in the way you interact and put together your core set of services. So in a way, a core set of services, by putting it together, can satisfy any kind of use cases, present and future one, known and unknown. It doesn't really matter if you did your job properly of identifying the core set of services. Right? And axiomatically, it's true that, by definition, for any system, there has to be a finite set of services, but by putting it together, you can satisfy any use case, present and future, and everything else, right? So, are you, so, so in those core services, are you saying that if you've picked the right ones, then you could essentially extend off of those to, uh, to uh, if you have ancillary types of use cases that you need to address, or that you can truly address those, those others? Extending a one? system is just one type of a change. Okay. Um, you can have zero extensibility in the system, but still the way you're required to do something will change. Okay. 
And so the first thing the method does is it gives you this template for classic areas to encapsulate and identifies the type of services in each area that you would be looking for. So if you look at the use case, the use case is basically a sequence of activities. And so what could change? Well, the sequence itself could change, meaning I'm, I'm still doing the A, the B, and the C, but I'm doing twice A and then the C and then the B. Or the sequence, the activity stays the same, but the sequence might change. Or the sequence may remain constant, but what, how you're doing a particular activity will change. Mm -hmm. I'm not making lunch, I'm making dinner, right? But the sequence will be the same, but the activity will be different. So the method then gives you a set of logical semantics for services that will encapsulate either the sequence, we call it a manager, or the activity, we call it an engine. And then it will also show you how to structure things. And so it guides you at doing that, but it can't provide uh, the work. You have to do the one editing. That's the only thing architects add value for, doing that. And the first thing you need to do is in an iterative way, keep looking for that set of services. And like I said before, it's axiomatic that every system has that set of services. It's not a big set, okay? Now, once you cannot think of any other use case, future and unknown one, that you will not be able to do with your core set of use cases, of, of services, you stop. This is it. This is your design. In fact, it doesn't mean, by the way, it's your best design. It doesn't mean, sorry, it doesn't mean it's the best design in the world. It just means it's as good as you can make it. It's your best design. And that's an important point to note because every... Uh, design effort uh, has a point of diminishing return. Meaning, if I look at a certain state of the design, I can spend another four months refactoring it and, and polishing it, ending up only saving another two weeks of development. That's obviously not a good trade. So every design effort always has a point of diminishing return. The method says that point in every system design is once you did your best and you have minimized the core set of services to the bare bone, but that core set now can satisfy any use case you can think of, you stop. You have reached your best. Everything from now on will be a waste of time as far as they keep refactoring it. Now once the decomposition is done, the message says that here are the other design aspects you need to think of. And there's simply a set of questions per aspect that the method is saying, here's how you should actually do it. It asks you, here's the question you have to ask. It even gives you a typical answer against the semantic of your services. So in that aspect, it's almost like a mid-grinder. You take the use cases, you crank the handle, and you get a design at the end. And that's the highly engineered, structured, mechanized approach for design that we have developed. And there's, there's really nothing to it. I mean, if you look through the slides or the bullets that you think it's, here's a question, here's a typical answer, here's a question, here's a typical answer. And it talks to where are your security boundaries, where do your authorization, where do your authentication, how does that propagate to your system, which process is hosting which service, how processes talk to each other, how you propagate events, and all and on, classic design aspects. And that's another thing that the method we developed is unique. It focuses highly on the required runtime behavior of a system. Many architects, when they do a system design, they stop at the static view. They say, here's a bunch of layers and a bunch of services in each layer, and that's my architecture. And I'm sorry, that's insufficient. That's like 5% of the architecture. If I can't look at that sort of static view and see if I'm using impersonation or not, how identities are managed, where do you do authentication, where do you do authorization, all the things I discussed before. And so the method captures that as well. And the other thing that uh, we developed is very simple notation for capturing these design aspects. Because the reality is that most commonplace notation like UML and, and various design tools are generations, plural, behind what you need. I said they're stuck in the 80s. Mm -hmm. They're stuck in expressing to great detail the uh, relationship between object and class hierarchies and such. You know what? That's not the problem we have anymore. Developers today pretty much know object orientation. The problem we have today is the inherent complexity of a highly modular system, which is how those various building blocks relate to each other. And that's part and parcel of what your design should express, and yet there are no notation in your mail for things like transactions, right. or authentication versus authorization. And so we also developed a very simple notation, talking about a line or a box, that's about it, that, or a bar for that matter, but by putting it in a particular context, gives the design semantic. Meaning, if you look as an analogy at uh, a building, and a building is not necessarily a complicated uh, entity compared to most of the systems, if you were to try and come up with a single diagram for a building, the diagram would be a solid black square, mm -hmm. right? All the information right. is superimposed on each other. Correct. Instead, what do we do? We have logical views. 
We have the plumbing diagram, the electrical diagram, the heating and cooling diagram, the structural diagram, right? The sewer diagram. And in each diagram, we look at a single logical view. So in the Andesan method view, it would be a transaction view, an authentication view, authorization view, process view, assemblies view, identity view. Now, if you look at each plumbing diagram or power line diagram, the notation in it are deceptively simple. Most notations are simply a blue line. Now, what the blue line means depends on the context of the diagram. So in the plumbing diagram, the blue line would be a water line. In the power diagram, it would be a power line. Mm -hmm. In a structure diagram, it would be a wall. It's still the same blue line, oh, okay. but we attribute semantic to what the blue line means. Right. Right? And so that's basically how we can express using uh, a line or a bar or a box virtually all design concept because we just give you the context at which this line actually means anything. Now, the other thing if you look at design diagrams is the or architecture diagram like a building or a car or a boat or an airplane or a bridge, none of them actually goes to the details. If I were to look at the plumbing diagram, the plumbing diagram doesn't show where all the couplers and the T's and the unions are. And if I look at the structure diagram, I don't see where every stud is and every drywall four by eight and every screw is. That's detail design. You never see it, right? So the method is architecture. It's no detail design. You will not see the couplers and the studs. Uh, if there's a bar that says you do authentication here, it doesn't say if it's Windows authentication, ASP.NET ASP membership, federated security. That's, that's all details, mm -hmm. right? Now, what this gives you is once the architect is done with the top level design with the architecture, depending on the composition of the team, is how you hand off the design to the developers. But obviously, it's an act of digital design. And what the architect needs to do is to follow up and close the loop, making sure the developers have actually complied with the design. And you use the diagram literally as a building inspector. You go and say, OK, is the wall here? Did you put the power line here? And it kind of like looks at the diagram. It's exactly the same process. It's not specifically related to the Addison method. It enables that kind of an inspection review uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean when it's, it's, it's a mechanized approach. It's also a wonderful way of disseminating the design knowledge across the team. Uh, time and time again, I interact with architects, and typically in a recovery mode, and the disaster has already happened, and they, they say, you know, I gave them a good design, they butchered it. <laughs> well, in, they missed the point. A good design is not if it's a good design in the architect's head, but if it's a good design on a whiteboard with a big don't erase uh, note next to it, or if you have a nice document that's saying here's the architecture, a good design is only a good design if it survived through developers and they didn't butcher it or castrated it, ending up on a customer machine. Then it's a good design. A good, a good design actually ends up getting implemented, implemented as, and as, as a good design. And deployed. And right? deployed, yes. And so for, and for that matter, the architect has to ensure that every last developer in a team actually operates along what the design is calling for and values the various design assumption and insights and operational constraints and such. Because if they don't value it, they're going to butcher it. We know they're going to butcher it, right? And so we don't expect necessarily every last developer in the team to be able to yield the design in the first place. We be able to look at the operate along it. We expect every uh, construction worker to be able to do it, and every right. uh, electrician. You have right? a foreman on a, on, on a build site who then basically helps to guide and direct Absolutely. and put this here and drill the whole, yeah. And you go to every garage mechanic shop, they all can actually look at the blueprints of a car. They can't design a car, but they can certainly look at the blueprint and figure it. out how to go to the carburetor, right? And so having graphical notation for all of this is essential because it enables you to ensure that the propagation of the design knowledge, the survivability of the architecture itself, which is another benefit of doing that. And doing this whole method takes about three to five days. It's not very time consuming. Really? Desi yes, design is not time consuming. You shouldn't be surprised. If you were to design and build your dream house, the first thing you say, I'm going to get an architect. So he or she comes along. You know what? Architects charge hourly. The moment somebody charges hourly, you know it's not going to be thousands of hours. If the architect spends more than a week or two weeks on your home, something is wrong. That's right? a great point. Yep. And so you spend two weeks at the most with an architect, and then two or three years with contractors, and you want to shoot all of them, <laughs> right? Because they're lying to you, and they're always late, and, and the costs go up, out the wazoo. But that's nothing to do with the design, was it? It's the implementation action, right? So it's the same with software. The design is not that time consuming. It's all the execution, the process behind it, the construction, that's where the, the time and the cost uh, are typically uh, uh, involved. And the same is true with, with software architecture. Especially if you follow the highly mechanized approach of, of the method, 
you will see that you can actually accelerate to that way. In fact, I would argue doing it in a week is part and parcel part of the method. And here's why. Suppose, uh, 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 if you look at a bunch of smart architects trying to design a software system, having analysis paralysis is almost uh, always the case. Uh, yeah, we can do it like this, but if we do it, okay, let's go back. If we do it like this, right, and they can spend all the time up front just doing this, not going anywhere. Well, the reality is that most of these decisions can be mechanized, according to what I said before. You don't need to spend the time on it. By putting a time constraint on it, like saying you, need, you only have three days for this or five days, you force them to, f to prioritize and focus on the task at hand. Mm -hmm. And another advantage of putting a time cap on the time you're going to spend on design is you eliminate design gold plating. Now, what's that? Developers are familiar perhaps with implementation gold plating. What's that? Suppose you have a coding task that lasts, lasts two weeks. What happens if you give a developer three weeks to do it? Are they going to work in for two weeks and stop? No, they're going to work in for three weeks. It's the Parkinson law. Work always expands to fill that lot of time. And so what are they going to do with the extra week? I mean, it's going to be spread across, of course. What they're going to do is they're going to add bells and whistles and complexity and features that nobody really wanted. Increasing the complexity of the system, reducing its inherent degree of cohesiveness, and so on. It's not very good to do gold plating, right? So if you think implementation gold plating is bad, think design gold plating. Yeah, yeah. What happens if you give the architect more time to design things that they should have had? Mm -hmm. They're going to add the bells and the whistles that the designer They're going to get away from the core services concept. Uh, on, yeah. on, on the core added value for the customer. Yeah. So let me tell you, if you give them five days or three days for it, it forces them to prioritize. There won't be design gold plating. And it's super aware of most uh, organizations. I mean, how many times people go to a meeting and the meeting lasts two hours, but you and I, two minutes into the meeting, we know what the outcome should be, we just have to wait for everybody else to get there. Mm -hmm. Now, suppose you're doing, you're doing the same meeting, but standing up. You think it's still gonna last two hours? <laughs> or everybody will see the light? Let's stand up meeting, yeah. They will, they will see the light sooner, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Right, so the same is true about design. So putting a time crunch on it is part and parcel. Now, maybe the first time you do it, it's gonna take you 10 days as opposed to five. But it really shouldn't take you more than three, five days, the second and third time you do it. And once you get to the hang of it, and we've done it, you know, so many times we've lost track. I estimate maybe 200 projects we did at least. Really? Okay. Uh, probably. Oh, well, I was going to ask if you've seen this, you know, apply to the real world and see. That's what we do. That's it. we. The I design business model is engaging customers doing just that. And so we are serial architects. We come into a customer on site Monday morning, knowing nothing about the system. We spend about half a day on the business. We have to understand the business. What is the business doing? What are the competitors doing? Could you show us a demo? What have you been doing before? We try and basically distill the course of use cases. We continue another two or three days to crank the handle and get the 60, 40, 50, 60 design diagram. It's a massive set of diagrams by the time we're done describing the system. And we also top it off with a vertical slice that shows how the various design uh, notation correspond to coding artifacts. Because the problem is your average developer team have never seen such a highly structured engineered approach for system design. And so you just give them 50 diagrams and say, code me this, they're going to give you a blank stir. Right. right? So I say it's the same blank stir that a caveman would give you if you show them a microwave. Mm -hmm. They say, what's that? Now, it doesn't mean the caveman is, is not smart. In fact, the innate intellectual ability of us and cavemen is exactly the same. You agree about that, yes. right? We haven't evolved uh, physically, biologically, in any way, shape, or form. But the microwave is out of context for the caveman. And so if you give 50 design diagrams to a developer and say, code me this, they're going to they're gonna give you a blank stare because it's out of context. So what we proceed to do is a vertical slice. Where we take all the layers and all the building blocks, and we just do do-nothing implementation of the building blocks. Oh, it can show zero, the same data set, whatever it is. But we wire it up according to what the method is calling for. And then you have a working slice of the system to demystify the diagrams. And we build a slice in about two days. And another advantage of it is we get to also do stress testing on the slice. So we get to see at the end of the week if there's anything in the architecture itself that inhibits scalability, throughput, performance goals. And a week into the project, we're already doing stress testing. Yes, doing stress testing at the end is wrong because if it's meeting the goal, great. If it's not, it's too late. Right. A week into the project, I need to know if I'm inadequate. Mm -hmm. And so we can only do this whole thing in a week, soup to nuts, Monday to Friday evening, if we follow the method, if we do it in a highly mechanized way. 
and that's what we do. We do it in and out, in and out, in and out uh, with customers. You know, and what strikes me about this is, is you know, <clears throat> I think you and I have talked um, off camera before about the architect identity crisis. You know, what, because there is there are architects in other part of the world, and their roles are very well defined. And that software architects sometimes struggle with, am I, am I an advanced developer? Am I, you know, where where do I fall into things? And what I what strikes me about your your explanation of this is how you've really taken that 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 structural building model and found a way to translate that very logically into software architecture. Because they, it, what this this is probably the closest you know analogy, I guess. If, if, as you've been talking about this, that I've heard that really makes, yes, that actually works. That I could see exactly how that would work and, and doing it mechanically, you know, it's, that's what I love about talking with you because I always go, well, you know, of course. <laughs> well, why didn't I think of that? Why hasn't anybody thought, thought of this before? So, I mean, I think it's, from, 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 from that standpoint, I think it could, I can understand how this would really resonate with someone because it's, it's very clear in its methodology. It's very clear from a role perspective, and then I really appreciate your comments about the architect being engaged with the developers. Uh, just like an architect on a, on a skyscraper is going to be on site, checking, making sure that the design is being adhered to. You can't throw it over the wall and walk away. So this is good stuff. This is really good stuff. So if uh, for those folks who weren't able to come to Tech Ed and have watched this and their appetites are wet and want to understand this process a little bit more, are there resources available that they can go look so, up stuff on? The best resource is the is a seminar I do called the Architects Masterclass, and I do it all over the world. Um, on the Addison website, you will find various mentioning of when we do it all over the world. We also do it on site, that's another option. Okay. And there's also a document on the Addison website called the Addison Method, where you can download the test season notation we're using. And that's probably the uh, the closer it could get to to experience it, but uh, maybe in the future I'm going to write a book on it. Okay. I don't give it in your much. free time. My free, my cupid is free time. <laughs> so well, this this has been great. Thank you so much for sitting down and talking about this because I'm I'm really excited about this. This is neat. I'm actually I think I'm going to hit that master class. Yeah, I think I was signed up once. And something happened. That's I, couldn't, right. I, I couldn't make it. Yeah, that's so sad. So anyway, uh, Juval Loey, yeah. thank you so much. Uh, Software legend, Zen master. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining me. My pleasure. That's all for this episode of ArcCast. I appreciate you joining us, and we'll see you next time. Uh, I'm your host, Danny Boyden, signing off. Take care.